you for joining today's educational webinar with Southern California Cancer Support Communities. I'm Abby Espinosa, the Program Coordinator at Cancer Support Community Los Angeles, and I'm honored to welcome you to this week's webinar titled Biomedical Aspects of Cancer 101. Before we begin, if this is your first time joining us, the Southern California Cancer Support Communities are a collaborative of four individual nonprofits, Cancer Support Community Creators Greater San Gabriel Valley, Cancer Support Community Los Angeles, Cancer Support Community South Bay, and Cancer Support Community Valley Ventura, Santa Barbara. We are premier nonprofit organizations providing vital social and emotional support to families facing cancer, including patients, caregivers, and their loved ones, all at no cost. Programs include support groups, healthy lifestyle classes, social activities, and educational programs such as this one. We'll provide information about our programs and services at the conclusion of this webinar. Before I pass it over to Keo Matsumoto to introduce today's speaker, please note that your video and microphone are automatically disabled for this webinar. You may, however, enter your questions into the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window at any time. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We may not be able to get to all of your questions today, but we'll get to as many as possible. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kayo Matsumoto, the Program and Clinical Director at Cancer Support Community Valley Ventura, Santa Barbara. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Walcott. Dr. Walcott is an emeritus attending in the Department of Psychiatry at Cedar sinai Medical Center. He spent the last 26 years of his career leading the development of oncology supportive care services at Cedar sinai Samuel Oshim Cancer Center and at a total of 19 other outpatient hospital cancer centers throughout the US managed by Nosalic Healthcare Optium Oncology. He has led, he has held in the leadership roles in the American Psychosocial Oncology Society and has for many years been an actively involved supporter of the cancer support community. He's past co-chair and current member of the board of directors at Cancer Support Community Valley Ventura Santa Barbara. It gives me great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, speaker Dr. Dean Walcott. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the title and a little bit more about me. And thank you very much, Kyle, for your uh, introduction. You've had a few technical issues about slides. So I hope that all works uh, out uh, very well. Uh, if you could go on to the next slide. Basically, from the conflict of interest standpoint, I have no uh, conflicts uh, to report with respect uh, to uh, this lecture. Next slide. Before we start, I'm go my, my goal is to share with you really the language of biomedical aspects of cancer and the underlying human realities that that language represents. Some of you may have extensive knowledge uh, about biomedical aspects of cancer, some of you may not. Uh, the uh, nature of this presentation is to be something like a mile wide and six inches deep in the sense that basically every one of the slides that I'm going to be uh, presenting, hopefully uh, rapidly and efficiently, uh, could be the basis of a more in-depth discussion about the underlying uh, uh, biomedical realities that underline that slide. I always start my uh, talks with uh, this slide, which I regard as one of the most important graphics ever presented about the important role of psychosocial care or oncology supportive care in cancer care. This is from the Institute of Medicine report in 2008. And they say appropriately that patients should receive a wide variety of important human services including psychosocial support and palliative care and care planning uh, and others from the moment of diagnosis forward. I would say with respect to psychosocial care, it should go all the way back to the uh, most uh, left-hand uh, column of prevention and risk reduction and screening because they're very important behavioral and emotional and psychosocial aspects 
of both knowing that one may be at increased risk for cancer for whatever reason and undergoing the uh, screening uh, process. But in any case, this makes the point that the importance of psychosocial care and palliative care and care planning is critical to all aspects of the cancer journey, but we're not gonna be focusing on that very much. We're really gonna be focusing on the biomedical world that uh, uh, is the basis for uh, the cancer care system from that standpoint. Next slide. So we're really gonna talk about uh, three interrelated uh, major uh, objectives with sections. The first is to provide overview level information about cancer epidemiology, the risk factors for cancer, prevention and screening for cancer, and diagnosis, staging, and prognosis. Next, we're gonna talk about uh, overview information concerning cancer-related symptoms and the major uh, categories of cancer treatment including surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and a whole wide range of other newer systemic therapies that are important parts of our current armamentarium. And then as we have time towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about kind of biomedical aspects of some of the human aspects of cancer related to cultural and diversity issues, cancer survivorship, advanced disease, end of life care, and younger and older cancer patient to populations. Uh, if, in fact, anyone should have interest in having these slides, you're most welcome to obtain them and to use them as you may see, see fit going forward. Next slide. So in this first section, again, we're going to talk about each of uh, these uh, dimensions of uh, uh, cancer, as I've just uh, briefly discussed. Next slide. The, the second section is going to talk about these, as we've said, including a little bit about cancer biology and the fact that there are certain oncologic emergencies that we as psychosocial healthcare professionals also need to be aware of that they exist. Uh, next slide. And then as we've said, to the extent we have time, and I hope we'll have some time to talk about some of these issues, not only from a psychosocial standpoint, but from a biomedical uh, standpoint uh, with respect to these uh, issues of uh, the age of the, the uh, patient and also cancer survivorship and cultural diversity. Next slide. Cancer is a collection of more than 100 diseases. As you probably know, in the general population, there is the sense that cancer is somehow a unitary or homogeneous uh, disease. It clearly is not. Uh, and if we look at both uh, the, the biology of uh, cancer and presentations of cancer and so forth, it's an extraordinarily complex uh, group of diseases, which is why when people commonly ask the question, when we're gonna cure cancer, it's important in engaging in that discussion to let them understand about that fact that it's a collection of uh, many, many disease processes. The fundamental underlying mechanism of cancer is that the DNA of the cells becomes altered or abnormal. Uh, and everything else that we see about the history of cancer uh, from a biomedical standpoint relates to that uh, reality that there's uh, abnormally altered uh, DNA in the cancer cells. It's important to state that there's profound genetic heterogeneity that uh, even within the same tumor, the biology of that tumor and the altered genetic abnormalities of that tumor may vary from one site in the same tumor to another. So that's another source of complexity, both of understanding the biology of cancer and its treatment. Cancer can in fact start anywhere in the body. We have roughly 75 to 100 trillion cells each and any one of them could in fact be the initial source of the, the, uh, the development of cancer. The core characteristics of cancer from a biomedical standpoint are you have cells that become increasingly abnormal. Old and damaged cells survive when they should die and unneeded new cells form in any given tissue. The cells lose their normal maturation, their normal function and their normal appearance. 
Then as a cancer becomes more established, these cells begin to spread into surrounding tissues, into local, regional, or distant tissues, such as within the same organ, such as breast, uh, or prostate, or uh, lung, or spread through the, the bloodstream, or by the uh, lymphatic system, uh, both locally and regionally, and possibly uh, distantly. And these cells, as we all know, can become large enough and substantial enough that they form obvious growths uh, and tumors, which may be present either locally where the cancer started or may be spread to anywhere throughout uh, the body uh, during the course of the illness. Next slide. We'll talk a little bit about kind of the, the broad terms that are used in describing uh, cancer. Uh, and we base these descriptions on the primary cell type and the site of origin. The cancer categories based on specific cell types are carcinomas, which are epithelial or covering cells. And the terms that the, the, the cancers that uh, fall under these kinds of, of uh, cancers include adenocarcinoma, uh, basal cell carcinoma, typically of the, the skin, squamous cell carcinoma, transitional cell carcinoma. Then there's a broad category of uh, cancers that we call sarcomas. And these are cancers that include the connective tissues, bones, muscle, fat, blood vessels, lymph nodes, uh, lymph vessels, and fibrous tissues such as tendons and ligaments. Then there are the hematologic malignancies, leukemia, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, either acute or chronic. These are cancers of the blood forming cells that we all have, or lymphomas of the lymphocytes, the, the lymphatic uh, part of the immune system. Uh, and these include commonly, for instance, Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. Then there's multiple Myeloma, which comes from plasmacytes. Melanoma, which comes from melanocytes. Next slide. Brain and spinal cord tumors. Germ cell tumors, which uh, arise from the cells which uh, arise themselves to uh, sperm or eggs. So-called neuroendocrine tumors, which are not uncommon, but can be uh, uh, very difficult to manage. Carcinoid tumors. Uh, so there are a wide variety of abnormalities of cell types uh, that uh, are part of the way in which we, uh, we describe cancer. The common process for the development of cancer is not you're fine one day and the next day you have a significant cancer burden in your body. Typically, there's a process where the patient has normal cells, then they begin developing more of them than there should be, what we call hyperplasia. They begin becoming abnormal, where we use the term dysplasia. There's carcinoma in situ, which is cancer, which is restricted to a very tiny initial area, uh, for, such as, for instance, ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a fairly common presentation in breast cancer. And then the cancers, which are more widespread locally or regionally, which we describe under the term of invasive uh, carcinoma. Next slide. These are the most recent uh, statistics uh, from the American Cancer Society. Uh, and uh, essentially we will have, it is expected in uh, 2024, about 2 million new diagnoses of cancer patients. And you can see uh, there the relative uh, the distribution in uh, uh, men and uh, women. And the estimated number of total deaths will be roughly 600,000 patients. Uh, and if you look at this, you will find, for instance, that while pancreas cancer is not very common, it's a fairly significant cause of death because it uh, is not well treated and has a quite short life expectancy uh, generally. So we're talking about 2 million new diagnoses. The number of uh, survivors is something in the 18 plus million range in the United States of people who've been diagnosed. And there is uh, altered distribution uh, and uh, patterns between men and women. Next slide. This makes the point, and we could spend more time on it, that the incidence rates of cancer 
vary by both race and ethnicity. And these are major categories that are uh, reported uh, uh, from uh, various government entities. And these are uh, present in the ACS uh, data. And as you can see, there's a pretty significant variation, not only between men and women, but among the various ethnic uh, groups that are uh, categorized for these statistical uh, purposes. For instance, Asian Pacific Islander patients have quite significantly lower rates than non-Hispanic uh, white uh, population. Uh, next slide. Also death rates are quite significantly uh, different by uh, race and ethnicity. And while these are somewhat older slides, the patterns have not really uh, changed uh, significantly uh, uh, at all uh, in, in this difference of cancer death rates based on race, race and ethnicity. Next slide. This simply shows the uh, patterns of cancer death rates over time. And as you can see in general, there have been some very uh, positive trends in overall death rates per 100,000 population with uh, black males starting out initially much higher and having come down, white males also starting higher and coming down uh, some uh, with some improvement in death rates in uh, black and white uh, females over this roughly uh, 40 year uh, period covered by this uh, graph. Next slide. So what are some of the cancer risk factors that are uh, established? And this is uh, from the National uh, Cancer Institute. Uh, as we all know, the older uh, age uh, individuals are at higher risk for developing uh, cancer. There's certain hereditary cancer syndromes, and we're gonna talk about that uh, a little bit uh, more. A wide variety of behavioral risk factors with uh, diet and obesity, use of alcohol, uh, use of uh, tobacco in many different uh, forms. Physical inactivity is thought to not be good for us, but whether it's a truly independent risk factor is not as well established. Then there are chronic uh, infections, which are actually major causes of uh, certain uh, cancers. Hepatitis C, which is associated with liver cancer, a number of strains of human papillomavirus, which can be associated with with uh, cancers both in men and women, and the Epstein-Barr virus, which is associated with uh, uh, lymphatic uh, uh, malignancies. Then there's chronic immunosuppression. Anybody who is immunosuppressed for any reason, either based on being on such medications, like for treatment of uh, a solid organ transplant, anybody who has chronic inflammation, a wide variety of hormones that individuals uh, may take uh, for a variety of uh, reasons. Uh, Long-term exposure is a risk factor. Excessive exposure to uh, sunlight over long periods of uh, time. Any exposure to radiation, either naturally occurring or uh, uh, radiation treatment for some other condition. There's a wide variety of cancer-causing substances and diabetes itself is associated with risk for certain cancers. So there's extraordinary risk, a uh, range of factors which can increase an individual's risk for developing cancer. Next slide. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, hereditary cancer syndromes and genetic testing. And in general, genetic testing is the ability that we have to test for uh, a person's chromosomes, their genes, which are on those chromosomes, or specific proteins, which are made really under the control of uh, genes. Uh, roughly 5 to 10% of cancers are thought to be due to inherited mutations, which uh, can be passed on from generation to generation. You may well be familiar with some of the hereditary uh, syndromes and the associated genes that increase the risk for that. Breast cancer and ovarian cancer are associated, and some other cancers are associated with the abnormalities of the so-called BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. There's a so-called Lee-Fraumini syndrome, which is associated with risk for many cancers, and that's an abnormality in a specific protein. There's the Lynch syndrome, or HNPCC, 
which is associated with the risk for multiple cancers. And there are four genes that can contribute to, to that cancer risk. A specific gene, which is associated with the risk for colorectal cancer and uh, a pre-malignant condition called familial adenomatous polyposis. So the key point is that we are have learned quite a bit and there's a lot more to learn as we go into the future about the relationship between specific genes or groups of genes and they're increasing the risk for developing cancer across generations. Next slide. Cancer uh, risk genetic uh, testing is an important part of our efforts to identify people who are at increased risk and hopefully help them lower their risk. Uh, and I'm not going to go through many of these slides in as much uh, detail as would be ideal, given the realities of time constraints. Uh, but uh, basically, we're well-established criteria for when people should be testing. The process of testing is really very important from a human and psychosocial standpoint, as well as from a genetic standpoint. And in general, genetic testing should be done in the context of uh, having the person having access to a formally trained genetics uh, uh, counselor. There are many factors to consider. What is the likely benefit or risk for the individual of knowing? What is the likely impact on the family if they learn of uh, a familially uh, transmitted uh, genetic abnormality that may increase their personal risk of developing cancer? The results of these testing may be positive and that we know the person's at increased risk and we understand what the abnormality is negative. There's no evidence of what we know that they're at increased risk or what is called uninformative negative, where it's negative, but we don't really know for sure what it means that it was negative. So everybody who receives testing should receive post-test counseling, determining what is the medical meaning, what is the follow-up care plan, and what is the psychological meaning and the meaning for the family of the results of this uh, test. There are specific uh, resources at the, the bottom if you want to, to kind of look into this uh, uh, more. Next slide. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about cancer prevention or risk reduction. There are a wide variety of approaches to trying to, to decrease an individual's uh, risk for developing cancer. Many of them relate to the use of uh, medications or hormonal blockers that uh, are used in prevention of hormonally sensitive cancers, with breast cancer and prostate cancer being the most uh, common uh, ones. Uh, there also are some benefits of so-called anti-inflammatory uh, medications, which can reduce the overall risk of death from cancer. As you know, there's a wide variety of uh, interests and wide variety of approaches in businesses that seek to uh, sell vitamins or various dietary supplements to decrease uh, the risk of cancer or to treat cancer. There is, in fact, no proven benefit of any of these in reducing either the risk of cancer or the uh, survival likelihood once cancer is diagnosed. Uh, and also, it's important to decrease exposure to environmental pollutants. For instance, asbestos is a major known risk factor for cancer. We all have are exposed to a certain amount of uh, indoor uh, and outdoor, but especially indoor radon, which is a naturally uh, uh, occurring element that has radioactive uh, property. So there's a lot that we know and a lot that is being done for people who are identified as being at risk for cancer, higher risk of trying to decrease their risk through medical uh, interventions. Next slide. Other risk reduction activities, we all know about the importance of decreasing cigarette smoking. And if you look at the decrease in cancer death rates among black men and, and white men, a lot of that reduction over time has to do with the fact that there have been decreased uh, frequency of uh, smoking in those populations over the last 20 or 30 years and therefore decreased risk for developing lung cancer, uh, decreasing alcohol consumption, preventive uh, surgery. I have a colleague who is a uh, uh, a man, but is at high risk for the development of breast cancer because of uh, a genetic uh, syndrome and ha himself had uh, a bilateral uh, mastectomy recently 
to further lower his risk of developing uh, cancer. It's quite common that women who are at high risk for breast and or ovarian cancer undergo preventive uh, surgery, as I'm sure you know. The human papillomavirus, uh, there's has many types and certain of those types are associated with the risk for developing cancer. So it's now a standard of practice that young uh, girls and really young boys should be, uh, should receive the HPV uh, vaccination uh, prior to adolescence. Uh, and this would reduce and is beginning to reduce the frequency of cancer in these specific areas in these populations. About 20,000 uh, a year uh, in women and decreasing the risk for cervical, vulvar, vaginal, anal, and back of throat cancer, and about 14,000 men with back of throat, anal, and penile cancer. So HPV vaccination is proving to be a very, very important public health me measure to decrease the risk of cancer in the younger population and as they age. Next slide. Cancer screening, which has been very important in the undergoing continuing review and policymaking uh, adaptations and will I'm sure continue to do so, but cancer screening activities that have been shown to reduce cancer deaths and that's the criteria that uh, the government uses to help determine whether screening is important is uh, colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy and high sensitivity, high sensitivity fecal occult blood tests have been shown to decrease cancer deaths from colorectal cancer. The use of a specific diagnostic uh, imaging process for heavy smokers in a specific age range decreases their risk of dying from lung cancer. Mammography in general is a very important uh, way to uh, reduce uh, mortality in uh, women over a broad range of their uh, lifespan. And pap test and HPV testing uh, decreases the risk of dying from cervical uh, cancer. Next slide. The wide variety of other uh, cancer uh, screening tests which have been used, but in general have not been demonstrated to decrease the risk of dying from cancer. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over this uh, uh, slide. So let's go on to the next one. So now we wanna talk a little bit about diagnosis. How is cancer actually diagnosed? And there are a wide variety of laboratory tests and imaging procedures, which may suggest that the individual has a cancer, but the only way to definitively and clearly diagnose cancer is to obtain tissue, which is reviewed by a pathologist. That's considered the so-called gold standard. So uh, there may be alarming findings from other approaches to uh, evaluating a person, but that is the necessary uh, approach to actually making the diagnosis, collecting tissue, uh, and then having that reviewed by a pathologist with expertise in, in cancer. And the various ways of obtaining these uh, the tissues, uh, needle biopsy, endoscopy, for instance, if somebody has an abnormality in the lung, uh, they may well have an endoscopic procedure and a biopsy of uh, uh, tissue in the uh, surface of the bronchus. Uh, just from a standpoint of knowing terms, an excisional biopsy is where you remove the full tumor and an incisional biopsy is where you remove only a small tissue sample for purposes of diagnosis. For instance, in breast cancer, it's quite common that uh, it's diagnosed with an incisional biopsy, not with a full excisional biopsy where the goal is removing the tumor completely. And then there's various forms of newer ways of diagnosing cancer based on uh, tumor uh, uh, DNA that circulates in the blood uh, system, so-called uh, liquid biopsies. Next slide. Now we're going to talk about grading. Uh, grading and, and uh, staging are very important parts of the biomedical team understanding how significant and concerning the cancer is and has tremendous uh, implications for the treatment plan. So first of all, we're gonna talk about cancer grades. For the solid tumors, not leukemias, but for the solid tumors, 
most cancer is graded from grade one to grade four. And the higher the grade number, the more concerning the uh, cancer is. In low grade, the cells are well differentiated. They look normal and they grow, but they spread quite slowly. And as you go up to grade four, the, the cells become increasingly abnormal. They spread much more rapidly. They're much more invasive, much more likely to spread to distant uh, regions. Uh, and so uh, to the extent you want to, or the patient wants to know and understand kind of the severity of their cancer from a biomedical standpoint, knowing the grade of cancer, and this is really based primarily on what is found at surgery and what pathologists find, but cancer grade is important. Next slide. Now we're gonna talk about staging, and I'm sure you're all well aware that almost all patients are aware of what stage of cancer they had when they were originally diagnosed. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about staging. There's so-called clinical staging where a physician or advanced practice nurse examines the patients and they find a, a, a tumor. Uh, uh, and so it can be staged based on what is found simply by a clinical examination. But as you can imagine, the best staging is based on all of the available information, what the clinician found, what was found at surgery, and what the pathology uh, found at uh, review. In general, uh, again, just as uh, uh, grading from one to four indicates more uh, severe uh, disease uh, from that standpoint, the stages also indicate as you go up the, the uh, staging number, more concerning disease. Stage zero or so-called carcinoma in situ, such as DCIS, which is a common one in, in breast cancer uh, that you see, uh, is indicates a very, very, very limited degree of uh, cancer in a very small area. Again, as we go from stages one to three, there's more extensive disease locally. It's more likely to have spread to the regional uh, lymph nodes. Uh, and stage four indicates that the tumor has spread either to distant uh, tissues in the same uh, part of the body above or below the diaphragm uh, or to uh, uh, another part of the body. And obviously the higher the stage, the more concerning the prognosis uh, and the more aggressive uh, treatment in general needs to be. Next slide. So the factors that go into staging, as, and we've really uh, talked uh, about this. The other, the other comment I'll make on the last uh, uh, part of this slide is so-called restaging. Patients may present with an initial stage of cancer, say stage two, but they receive uh, treatment, they have surgery, they have chemotherapy, uh, and so forth. And after that initial round of treatments is completed, they're often restaged, basically to say, have they responded to treatment? Is there further disease that we need to treat or are they doing well? And have they really completed their initial round of cancer treatment? So restaging does occur, but from the standpoint of kind of uh, official uh, description of the patient's disease, their initial stage is what goes with them. If that was stage three initially, that terminology in general will go through them for the rest of their uh, treatment course. Next slide. This is just an example uh, of the complexity of uh, staging. Not that I expect you to see it or understand it particularly, but it just points out that in staging, as with other solid tumors, you're really looking at where the tumor is, how big it is, and the extent to which it is spread to regional lymph nodes and or has spread to other uh, parts of uh, the uh, body. And there's similar staging criteria for all of the uh, solid uh, tumors. And as well as really using different criteria, all of the hematologic tumors like leukemias as an example. Next slide. Talk a little bit about cancer uh, prognosis. Overall, during the course of my professional life, the five-year survival in cancer has gone from a roughly 50% to roughly 67%. Uh, 
uh, which is actually uh, a very important progress in our fight against uh, cancer, although clearly we have a long ways to go. The five-year survival rates are really uh, based on all of these factors, and I'm not going to go through them, but really staging and grading uh, are uh, very important. And we're going to talk about specific tumor biology a little bit later. And in the, the way we understand the effectiveness of treatment is using a terms about survival. And I just want to use those terms in case you hear them. Uh, there's the cancer-specific survival rate. That means that uh, somebody was diagnosed uh, with cancer, was treated with cancer, and typically five years is the time at which we uh, describe uh, five-year survival. So they may have died from something else, but they didn't die from cancer. So that's the cancer-specific survival rate. Overall survival rate is how long is the person still alive, if not died from any cause. And disease-free survival is the patient was treated, the cancer is completely gone, it did not come back for a certain period of time. That's very uh, positive news. And the longer that period of being disease-free survives, the better the person's longer-term likelihood of long-term uh, uh, survival and disease-free uh, progression. So those are just terms that I thought it's reasonable to understand when we talk about survival rates in cancer. Next slide. I'm not going to talk about, well, no. Now we go on to uh, the, the second section uh, where we're going to talk more about approaches to treatment of uh, our cancer. Next slide. As you probably are aware, cancer can present with a wide variety of symptoms, which may not be necessarily specific to cancer, but the longer lasting they are, so forth and so on, the more one is concerned this isn't simply an infectious disease or something else, but it's a sign of a serious disease such as potentially cancer. So again, I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, but pretty much any uh, body system uh, can result in symptoms that in fact are the early symptoms of a cancer itself. Uh, and the whole business of trying to understand from the story of symptoms, whether they're serious, whether they need further evaluation for a possible cancer is a complex medical uh, challenge. I'm gonna just say this about systemic symptoms uh, which are very commonly initial presentations of cancer when the, there may not be any other evidence that the patient is not in good health. If a person has unexplained and undesired weight loss, whether they experience night sweats chronically as a new symptom, whether they experience new onset fatigue or weakness. Those are very concerning systemic sy uh, symptoms that can occur at any age and should always raise concern in the medical care system that the patient needs to be uh, evaluated for possibility of having cancer. Next slide. Common symptoms due to its uh, cancer and its treatment. Many of these, I'm sure that as you care for patients, they experience uh, these symptoms uh, are commonly interrelated to each other and a patient may have many symptoms. Uh, cancer pain is a great concern for many uh, patients and is, a, uh, in fact, a common symptom uh, in cancer, uh, sometimes in early stage cancer, commonly in patients with more advanced disease. And excellent management of uh, cancer pain is a very important part of providing best care. I want to talk about fatigue. You may or may not be aware that actually Fatigue is a very common initial presenting symptom, even before cancer is diagnosed. Fatigue is very common, probably actually more common than uh, significant cancer pain. And fatigue is in general more disabling than even pain. So I think if we, under, if we think about uh, the life experience of cancer patients, and the impact of their cancer and its treatment on their own life experience, fatigue is a very important problem. And as we seek to understand patients and provide various therapeutic approaches to helping them, it's uh, very important that we communicate with them about fatigue, that they learn how to communicate with their primary care 
uh, providers and that fatigue be well managed. And there are approaches to managing fatigue, even if it's due to the acute effects, for instance, of radiation therapy uh, as uh, one example. We're all familiar with anxiety and depression and insomnia as very common symptoms of uh, the effects of cancer from a diagnostic and treatment standpoint, the stresses that people experience uh, and a very important part of what we commonly do in helping support and educate and uh, counsel uh, patients. Wide variety of other uh, symptoms also. And again, I'm not gonna talk about them uh, other than to say with respect to cognitive symptoms, uh, we uh, know that many of the regimens, treatment regimens, specifically many of the chemotherapy treatment regimens actually are associated with impaired higher levels of cognitive function. And these impairments may be pretty significant and they may last for a significantly long period of time, even after the treatment itself is uh, completed. So uh, it's just important to understand that uh, patients who complain of being foggy or having trouble with memory or concentration or focus, uh, it can be personally very significant and should be part of our thinking about how we can understand and help that patient. Next slide. There are such things as oncologic emergencies. I'm not gonna talk about them, but it's important, I think, even those who of us who are primarily in a psychosocial care uh, role with uh, patients, just understand that there can be acute events that are immediately life-threatening. Uh, uh, and uh, to the extent that any patient experiences any of these symptoms of those, they should immediately receive very high-level oncologic care. Next slide. Talk a little bit about Surgery, and again, we're really talking about the language of surgery, which hopefully will be helpful uh, to you. What are the intent of surgery? There's curative, where the desire, the intent is to fully remove the tumor and all tumor cells and effectively to cure the patient. Then there's so-called debulking it, it, it intent, where a tumor is very large and cannot be uh, fully removed, but if it's partially removed, the tumor, the remaining tumor re may respond better to chemotherapy or other treatments. There's so-called cytoreductive surgery. This is common in, for instance, women with gynecologic uh, cancers who have seeding uh, of the uh, uh, peritoneal wall of the abdomen, where there may be 10 or 20 or 50 small tumors that where the the intention of surgery is to go in and remove as many of those tumors as, as possible. Then there's palliative or symptomatic surgery, which is designed to really treat symptoms that are secondary to tumors that are causing pain, that are impairing the function of uh, various organs uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, surgery may be done open or through minimally invasive techniques, uh, robotic uh, surgery as an example. And then there are other rarer approaches to uh, surgery that I've just put in for completeness sake at the end. Next slide. Now we'll talk briefly about radiation uh, therapy. And again, I wanna kind of uh, uh, share with you uh, the, the, the language that's used in, in describing uh, radiation therapy in cancer. Definitive radiation therapy is where it is part of a regimen with curative intent. Or it's quite common, for instance, in women with breast cancer who are diagnosed at a relatively early stage of their uh, uh, cancer, that the intention is cure. And radiation therapy, surgery, and chemotherapy may all be part of an initial uh, regimen. So anytime radiation therapy is being given with the intention of being part of a cure, that's called definitive radiation therapy. Palliative radiation therapy is designed to lessen symptoms due to the tumor. It's not designed, intended to, uh, to cure the patient, but to lessen symptoms of pain. If for instance, a person has a, uh, a bone tumor that needs to be, that's painful, that needs to be uh, treated and a variety of other uh, reasons, including if patients have uh, metastases, say in the spine, where they could have a fracture and could cause neurologic uh, damage. Uh, so palliative uh, uh, surgery uh, or palliative radiation therapy, excuse me, is 
a very important part of uh, treatment, particularly for patients with advanced disease. There are various approaches to radiation therapy, external beam radiation therapies with so-called linear accelerators. This historically and still the most common. There's specialized uh, treatment using proton uh, beams, which are, there are a limited number of sites and indications, but some patients receive proton beam therapy. There's internal radiation therapy where there's a source of radiation therapy that say is uh, implanted sometimes in the breast uh, sometimes treat uh, prostate uh, cancer. And then there are, uh, for uh, patients uh, in, with certain rare conditions, there's uh, essentially uh, uh, treatments that are designed to circulate through the blood, uh, get to where the tumor is, and to uh, uh, provide radiation that therefore uh, uh, damages or destroys tumor cells. Next slide. Just some more terms about when you have radiation therapy in coordination with surgery and chemotherapy. And again, breast cancer is a common example. Neoadjuvant radiation therapy or neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy means when this therapy is provided before the initial cancer surgery. Uh, and uh, that's uh, fairly commonly used in a variety of settings, including often with uh, breast cancer patients or other uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, cancers. Intraoperative radiation therapy is when the patient, for instance, it's fairly common now for undergoing breast surgery and they decide to implant a radiotherapy source during the course of the surgery itself. Uh, and we've really talked uh, about uh, definitive uh, treatments with these various modalities and palliative and again, there's palliative chemotherapy, just as there is uh, palliative radiation therapy or palliative surgery, where the goal is to improve the quality of life and decrease uh, symptoms, not uh, with the expectation of curing the patient or necessarily extending life significantly. Next uh, slide, please. Definitive or curative intent radiation therapy, typically, and this is undergoing changing and it varies somewhat by a variety of factors, including a specific cancer itself, but typically it lasts for five to seven weeks, the treatment regimen. Typically there's five treatments per week with a total of something like 30 or so treatment sessions. And this can be a major stress, obviously, for patients in terms of travel time and the impacts of uh, treatment including on progressive uh, fatigue. Uh, external beam uh, uh, treatment for palliative intent, where the goal is palliation, there may or may not be formal treatment planning. There are often a much smaller number of radiation therapy sessions, often say one to two or three. Uh, so uh, that's a much briefer course, often a, a greater amount of radiation therapy per session. Uh, and again, the goal is uh, maximum benefit with minimum toxicity to the uh, patient. And then these other uh, modalities, uh, as we have uh, talked about really already, intraoperative, like with breast cancer, or uh, a radiation therapy source that's in, in, implanted to treat a gynecologic or prostate uh, cancer as an example. Next slide. Chemotherapy, we're all familiar with that. The problem with chemotherapy is it, it kills fast-growing cells, but we have a lot of healthy, fast-growing cells in our body normally. So there tends to be a lot of damage to the uh, oral uh, and the GI tracts and, and other, uh, other uh, fast-growing cells in the body. Well, there are multiple routes of administration, intravenously, injection, intrathecally, into the spinal uh, uh, fluid, interperitoneally, and so forth. So there's a lot of routes of administration of chemotherapy and the timing of care of chemotherapy as we've talked about. There's curative intent where the chemotherapy may be given before surgery, neoadjuvant or adjuvant after surgery. For recurrent or metastatic disease, patients may have multiple episodes of chemotherapy and those are given the name of a line. So the second is a second line of therapy, third line, and so forth just language that may be helpful to you to know if you don't already. Next slide. 
The language of chemotherapy, typically patients have regimens. Each regimen may have multiple chemotherapy drugs. Typically a regimen lasts for six, four to six months. Within each regimen, there be, may be individual cycles, typically four to six cycles within a regimen, which may each be three to four weeks uh, in length. And then if you want to stay, uh, state specifically where the patient is in treatment, you can say C3D7. That means it's the third cycle of treatment in the regimen. And it's the day seven of that cycle. Often our chemotherapy regimens have multiple toxicities. And fortunately, we now have treatments which we didn't have when I was younger for managing, for instance, nausea and vomiting much more effectively than we used to. Many of the chemotherapy agents can decrease the white blood cells, can put the person at risk for infections or red blood cells can make them anemic or decrease platelets, which may increase the risk for uh, bleeding. Next slide. There are different approaches to managing chemotherapy for these second and higher lines of uh, uh, chemotherapy when patients have recurrent uh, disease. The only comment I'm gonna make on this slide is that oral chemotherapeutic agents have become much more common over roughly the last 10 years. However, overall, there are some additional challenges. They may not be quite as effective as intravenous chemotherapy. The patients have to adhere to the oral uh, uh, regimen, and we have found that uh, regimen adherence is not as ideal as we would hoped it would be. And historically, many oral regimens uh, insurance companies may not pay for or may not pay much for, so the patient may have very significant financial challenges on an oral chemotherapy uh, regimen. Next slide. There are wide Looking at our timing, I'm going to go through some more uh, fairly rapidly. You're probably familiar that there are hormonal therapies, particularly for breast uh, cancer and also for prostate cancer, which are the common hormonally responsive uh, treatments. Uh, and in many cases, these uh, hormonal uh, regimens, which are given uh, after uh, treatment or as part of treatment, may be long term. For instance, historically a tamoxifen or aromasin for long-term uh, reduction of risk for recurrence of breast cancer, maybe five-year regimens. In some cases, people are on even regimens that are even longer than that. So uh, this is a very long-term serious commitment. And basically all of these hormonal therapies have a wide variety of potential and frequently actually present significant side effects with, for instance, depression, uh, abnormal abnormalities of the vascular uh, system uh, related to, for instance, uh, menopausal hot flashes and so forth. So these hormonal treatments can often be actually over time fairly difficult for patients to tolerate. And we do know that the actual uh, level of adherence over the longer term in many of these uh, hormonal uh, regimens uh, diminishes quite substantially and is a major problem with respect to decreasing patients' risk of recurrent cancer. Next slide. Again, I'm not going to go with, uh, let's go on to the next slide. We've really talked about the fact that these medications and specifically with breast and prostate cancer can cause a wide variety of very personally significant side effects with uh, anxiety and depression and uh, fatigue uh, being very, very common and very troubling for patients. Next slide. You probably are well aware that there are a whole wide variety of uh, biological therapies, which have come on the scene, again, let's say roughly in the last uh, 10 years or so, and there's a wide variety of them. They have a wide variety of mechanisms of action. Uh, they are often used now in conjunction with chemotherapy uh, uh, regimens. Uh, and uh, while in general, they bring some real benefit in terms of lowering the risk of recurrence and extending survival, they also have a wide variety of very significant uh, side effects, which are commonly underestimated, under-evaluated, under-treated 
in the medical oncologic world. Kathy, are you telling me I need to stop quite soon? Uh, why don't you, um, uh, this was just your, uh, your signal to, you've got a few minutes left. Okay. So, yeah, but, so maybe take another two or three minutes okay, and then we'll good. take some questions. Good. Thank you very much. Next slide. Next slide, the one point I'll make about this slide is that these medications are often very expensive and many of them in fact are well over $100,000 a year. Uh, and it's a major financial uh, toxicity for patients and a major challenge actually to our uh, healthcare system, the costs of uh, cancer treatment. Next slide, let's see if there's anything else that I really need to. Again, we've talked about that. I would just make the point that many of these newer biological therapies have very significant neuropsychiatric side effects, impaired cognition and mood and anxiety and trouble with sleep. Uh, and in general, they these side effects improve after treatment is completed, but in some cases, they don't. So if you have a patient who has new onset or worsening trouble with cognition or depression or anxiety on these medications, uh, it's valuable for them to have that discussion with their primary oncologist about what approaches may be that would uh, be available to d diminish the effectiveness of or the, the, the adverse effects of these medications. Next slide. I think I'm about through with what realistically, again, this is just simply a list. And again, you probably well are uh, are aware of many of them, and probably a significant number of your patients uh, actually have, are on one or more of these uh, immunologic oncology therapies. I'll just make the point that we now know that cancer, in many cases, actually is able to progress to spread because the immune system is not able to keep the cancer in check. And there are now very sophisticated medications that are available that help overcome the blocking that the cancer has on the immune system so the immune system can do its job. And I think probably, Kathy, this would be a good time for me to stop in view of time. That's terrific. I will stop uh, screen sharing and uh, just remind our participants if they would like uh, a copy of your slides. And thank you so much for, for oh. offering those that they can um, email us at info at Cancer Support LA. Um, so we've got a few minutes um, for Q&A and uh, we've had a few questions come in. And if you have a pressing question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A. And I am Kathy Riley, the Associate Director of Programs at Cancer Support Community Los Angeles, and I'm honored to have Dr. Walcott here with us today. Uh, first question, what is your opinion of the metabolic therapy or the metabolic theory of cancer? Um, and they're, they're noting as per Dr. Thomas uh, Seafried. Well, can I, I can't say I have profound knowledge and expertise. Okay. Clearly, all of the cancers have their own pathways of how they induce abnormalities in the cell and go on to develop cancer. Clearly, anything, and so they all induce really abnormal metabolism in the cancer cells. Uh, and some of them uh, can... Uh, some of them we have putative mechanisms, which make sense. So are there metabolic abnormalities in cancer? I think the answer is yes. I do not have any sophisticated knowledge of the extent to which treatments based on those, uh, that, those mechanisms of action have actually been demonstrated to effectively work in preventing treating cancer. But uh, what I learned in medical school was we knew everything there was to know about medicine and cancer. And now, many decades later, we, our actual level of knowledge, as amazing as it is, is still a tiny part of understanding the complexity of cancer. Going back to the initial point I made, cancer is at least 100 different diseases, each of which has its own unique tumor biology. 
Um, an additional question that um, that came in um, is about a particular medication called uh, finasteride. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can, can address this or not, but um, just advice on um, its safety and benefits and side effects. Um, well, I'm not going to comment on it for, on its oncologic effectiveness. It clearly is used. It has a rationale, uh, and it clearly has some effectiveness. But what I would say is that, and some other of the related treatments have very significant psychological risk, very significant psychological side effects, mostly depression and uh, to a certain extent, anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, and so forth. So I think from the standpoint of, because uh, I spent my life as a psychiatrist working in the cancer center population, and I did that a lot for many, many years myself, um, the, the important thing is to help identify when patients are having significant psychological distress, doing whatever we can, and making sure there's communication with their primary oncology team, the physicians, nurses, so that they know and understand that these symptoms exist, know how bad they are, and with the patient can make the, de the determination, is it wise to continue this treatment? Can we adjust the dose? Can we adjust the regimen? Is there another treatment that may be effective that would have fewer psychological and psychiatric side effects? Great, thank you. Another question, uh, what do we know about uh, cancer surgeries, whether they are curative or debulking, that contribute to the creation of new metastatic sites? Well, it's a very uh, serious concern, okay? And there is no question, particularly in uh, cancers within the abdomen, the peritoneum, particularly gynecologic uh, cancers or cancers of the GI tract, that kind of inherent in the process of doing the surgery, you were exposing the patient to the possibility that a certain number of cancer cells may escape into the surrounding area and may seed uh, a new cancer developing. You know, this is a I, I think every surgeon I've ever run across who does cancer surgery is very aware of these risks. Extraordinary efforts are made to try to reduce the possibility of cancer cells being uh, freed from the tumor specimen uh, during the, the, the surgery. Uh, but I don't think there's any question that we will never be at the place where the risk is zero no matter how sophisticated the surgery. And of course we have robotic surgery and minimally invasive surgeries and a lot of very important surgical advances. Uh, and, and, but nobody can ever say the risk is zero of that happening. Thank you. And we, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. There's a, um, a question that just uh, came in about, um, hearing that chemo can cause depression. This was the, the first time um, this particular mm -hmm. participant has, has heard that. And uh, the statement is they were always led to believe that, um, you know, it's, it's the person who's struggling, but not necessarily the, the chemo contributing to that. So perhaps you could sort of frame that for, you know, right. for all of us. Okay, well, clearly, we all know as psychosocial healthcare professionals that there are profound stresses related to cancer and its treatment, the profound sources of anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress and ongoing traumatic stress. I mean, the, 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 the human psychology of cancer and its treatment is extraordinarily important uh, and so forth. With that said, all of the treatments for cancer can alter neurobiological mechanisms with the human being that increase their risk of cancer. Not related to this question specifically, but one of the experiences I had as a young psychiatry resident at UCLA was a guy who came in with new onset depression. 
and had no history of depression, was severely depressed, and had lots of kind of treatment. And I said, evaluating him and just knowing his history, said, I think he's got cancer. There was no evidence of that. Turns out, in fact, he did. And as we now know and knew back then, pancreatic cancer is one of those cancers which is specifically associated with the risk for depression, often as the first manifestation of the cancer well before there. So the whole business of the neurobiology that underlies depression as a specific example can be related to the underlying biology of the tumor and to the underlying neurobiological effects of treatment, including chemotherapy agents. Because chemotherapy in general doesn't only go to the tumor cells, it goes everywhere. And again, as I said, it can affect all rapidly growing cells in general, chemotherapy does not cross the blood-brain barrier specifically, but the impact of, uh, uh, of these medications, uh, biologically speaking, is very significant. So yes, there's no question that, and some specific chemotherapy agents are more likely, and some individuals are more uh, likely themselves more at risk. But chemotherapy absolutely can cause anxiety and depression very significantly, as well as impaired cognitive function. Uh, well, I wish we had time to uh, to discuss and, and take additional questions, but uh, thank you so much for your meaningful presentation, all the detailed information, and I love how you equipped us um, with information about uh, language and, and terms that are used in different treatment modalities. That was particularly helpful for me, so thank you. And with that, I am going to pass things over to uh, Rebecca Sowell from Cancer Support Community South Bay. Um, Rebecca, you've got some information to share with us and a final slide. Yeah, thank you so much, Kathy and Dr. Walcott. Abby, if you can um, share the screen. Perfect. So hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca, the program manager at Cancer Support Community South Bay. Thank you so much for joining us for today's program. And thank you again to Dr. Wolcott for your wonderful presentation. On this closing slide, we featured each cancer support community in Southern California. You can use your QR, the QR code to reach a particular location. Um, our mission uplifts and strengthens people impacted by cancer by providing support fostering compassionate communities, and breaking down barriers to care. We envision that everyone impacted by cancer receives the support they want and need throughout their experience. So please reach out to any one of us for the support you need. And thank you again for joining us today, and we hope to see you in a future webinar. Mm -hmm.